again, Paolo and Apex, and thank you, Bourdieu. Uh, it was a pleasure to be a paper boy in West <laughs> Lafayette and Apex. I hope it doesn't stop again now. So uh, I teach at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, uh, city of Ribeirão Preto, which is our agribusiness capital, and I, see, I teach also at uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas, the business school in Sao Paulo. So I have a chance to stay in both cities uh, during, during my week. Uh, also uh, created a, a think tank, a, a company called Markstrat some time ago, uh, 15 years ago, and we do a lot of projects in Brazil for food and agribusiness. Feel free to interact because you know we are here to build up a dialogue, to start talking to each other, to share information and to improve our knowledge. And this is what we got uh, here since uh, 8 a.m. So um, I'm offering you a new uh, platform for knowledge. Um, that we created this year, everything for free, full of books, uh, papers, uh, videos and others, uh, feel free to use and uh, be in touch with us uh, using this platform. We have around 60 people working on it and the idea is to spread information about Brazil, about global agribusiness and our opinions. So this is the, we had to go more digital also to talk to our students, yeah? because when I started teaching they didn't have a phone and now they have a phone, so I have to occupy their phone. If not, if I don't occupy their phone, they're going to be disturbed with other things that don't look at me at all. So my strategy is to occupy their phones, and that's why we produce digital content, and they have to look at it, and then we keep their attention going on. Um, so I, I thought in uh, how to do this uh, difficult uh, challenge here of uh, trying to close a wonderful amount of speeches that we had, and I was thinking, in what could I provide in terms of, uh, uh, for this audience, that could be interesting for you uh, to take home? So uh, we are talking now more to the future, and it's a pleasure to be sharing here with Tom. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm raising the 10 topics that I think will be very important for us to think in the coming uh, years, and how Brazil is positioned itself uh, in these topics and also with some small case studies in each of the topics. So you have here my 10 topics. I plan to talk uh, 15 minutes in each of these topics. <laughs> so uh, feel free to leave, to have lunch, to have dinner and come back. I'll be here maybe until midnight. But uh, let me start with the first one. I think there's no more doubts here that we have the Asian and African driven uh, food and bioenergy demand. Uh, it was spoken here that we have uh, uh, 9 to 10 billion people in the planet in 2050. We all know that, but maybe we don't know that 80% of these stomachs will be in Asia and in Africa. So when you look at the trade, a uh, food trade in the future, the, the gray part in the right side is the future, you see the continents that are going down and the continents that are going up. I know that you're tired, but it's a very nice chart to understand. Uh, over here in, in the axis you have the billions of dollars, so surplus or deficit, and the, the lines that are in the middle, the, the areas of the world that are in the middle, is the, the countries that will sell and buy the same value in terms of food. Okay, so they are in a kind of equilibrium in terms of value, although they may import wheat and sell orange juice, for instance. The ones that are going up are, are the ones that will increase their surplus, and the ones that are going down are the ones that will increase their deficit. So with this chart, you can see that food is moving from the Americas to Africa and Asia in the future. So this is the, the, the first uh, information. Uh, we have uh, a huge consumption growth going on because some of these countries are far away uh, what we have in the US and in Brazil. Uh, we have 85% of urban population in Brazil, also here. Uh, when you go to India, when you go to China, it's still half and half, and these people moving to cities, changing their consumption habits, and going more towards protein. I remember uh, reading a case study of McDonald's in India. They were opening one new uh, unit every 15 days. So uh, it's a huge amount of uh, change. It's, it's a huge change in the way people are consuming food. And here you have on the left side, the projections for poultry imports, in the middle a pork, and on the right side beef. And these were done before the African swine fever uh, uh, hitting part of Asia. So it's incredible, I will just point out one of the topics here, if you look at the red in the right side, that's beef and that's China. 
uh, for uh, we, the US and, and Brazil, are very lucky that the Chinese tasted beef and they loved beef. And they won't be able to produce the beef uh, they, they, they need. They won't be able to produce the pork meat they need because of restrictions. So uh, part of this production will be moving to the US and moving to Brazil. Uh, I heard uh, statistics that they are eating four kilos of, uh, of beef per, per capita per year and that's going to go to eight uh, in 10 years. For us it's a weekend of a barbecue in Brazil, but when you multiply four kilos difference plus 1.4 billion people, it's like 70 or 80 percent of what Brazil produces today in beef. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge increase going on and let's not forget Africa also that's urbanizing several countries with a strong development, income distribution and other things going on. And I, as I told you, this was done before the, the swine uh, fever event. So if you look at Brazilian data, I'm, I, I'm not going to disturb you with all of these, but just pay attention in the food and agribusiness exports that we do. Look at the first one, China. Look how much it was in 2000. $560 million US dollars in food and agribusiness products. Look at 2018, almost $36 billion. So we have one China, that's the first line, and we have a second China that I want you guys to pay attention, is the countries that start from the bottom to the middle. So if you put all these countries together, they become a second China in Brazilian imports. Countries like Arab Emirates, India, Egypt, Thailand, Vietnam, look at these countries, they didn't buy anything from uh, food and agribusiness in Brazil, now they're buying $2 billion a year. So it's a huge difference. I, I used to call this chart as the two Chinas uh, chart. So this shows us the first point. Uh, we have to be prepared to supply food for Asia and Africa mostly. The second one uh, was already touched here in, uh, in a great way by our ambassador. And I have also to talk about this because this uh, changes to, moves us to competitiveness, is the uh, economic reforms going on in Brazil and uh, the benefits that this will bring to the supply chains. So I'm not to link it to any political party, any specific government, so this is why you're going to see that uh, the era that I put up there is not linking to any type of government, it's true governments, but we have now in Brazil what I call a fever towards reforms going on in Congress. I just put out three uh, uh, headlines of today's newspapers in Brazil, and you can see the results of, of, of these reforms that are going on. So uh, we approved a very tough reform, that's the pension funds. I'm not going to go through all the reforms that are going, in, going on. Uh, we have labor, we have uh, investments coming to uh, roads, uh, railways, oil, $17 billion uh, uh, last week in, 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 in uh, transferring the exploration of some oil uh, reserves to the, to the uh, private sector. Uh, and you can see, uh, just to summarize, uh, uh, it's, it's much more a business-driven society now and uh, less state-driven as we were uh, before 2016. So the reforms did not start with this president, it started with the vice president of the previous government and they are moving very fast. Uh, and this will bring more competitiveness to business because it will make it more simple to work, it's going to make more attractive for people to invest and also to understand. On the right side, uh, most of you guys have seen those images of the large, long lines of trucks uh, in, in the unpaved roads, and now the road that takes the grains to the north of Brazil is just uh, one mile and a half away to be finished. And this was done by the military. So it's a, it's a change of a mindset towards infrastructure uh, going on in Brazil that I think it's very important. The third topic is uh, we do still have uh, to expand uh, the food production in the world because uh, what we've studied until 2050 and Brazil has an important role to do that and I want to show you what are the plans of uh, our <coughs> ministry and our government. Why is it important to expand production? Uh, we heard here this morning the, the, the fear to have a second problem or a third problem in the last 10 years with the commodity prices so the consumption is, is, is coming and the production has to react in order to keep this price trend. 
Uh, let's remember that Brazil and the U.S., they have a very important and social role to the world. We are suppliers of food and we are responsible for food getting cheaper in the world. So we are re reducing hunger. That's important to tell because with the same amount of resources, people can buy more because of the efficiency gains that we had in these two agricultures in the last 15, 20, 25 years. These were transferred because it's perfect competition. These efficiency gains were transferred to final consumers in more competitive poultry prices, uh, soybean prices, and all other products that we are uh, producing. So we have to continue to do that. Brazil has an importance and, uh, and, and had a, a growth, occupying some uh, uh, good positions in the world production and share uh, exports of uh, several products, as you can see here. It's not an irrelevant country anymore or as importer of food as we had a chance uh, to listen uh, also this morning. And uh, this growth was uh, uh, very um, attractive to follow. And I can tell you that I'm very lucky to be an agronomist in Brazil in the last 27 years because I've seen a Chinese growth in agriculture, not in the country, in agriculture. So this was important because it created a lot of new cities, created a lot of development in the interior of the country, and took a lot of new business uh, to the cities, uh, helping to spread the money that's coming in. So uh, Brazil is exporting $100 billion per year in food and agribusiness products, so you can imagine this per day. And this money is flowing inside the country and helping to promote uh, investments and also uh, income distribution by generation of opportunities. Uh, so here's the growth that we expect uh, for the coming 10 years. Uh, it's already measured in order to try to supply this 20, 25 million tons of grains per year that the demand in the world grows. So uh, Brazil will jump from 246, that's not 236 anymore, it's 246, this crop, to 300 uh, million tons. It's, it's going to be the size of uh, the U.S. corn crop. And meat, we're going to go from 26 million tons to 33 uh, million tons. And I think this is a little bit, uh, I would say that the number would be a little bit higher because this statistics done by our ministry was before uh, again, the African swine fever. This will change a little bit the rules of the game. So uh, if you look at the areas in Brazil, we are going to jump from uh, 75 to 85 million hectares when you consider all the crops, okay? And if you go to the right side, it's only grains. Grains will jump from 63, that's this year, 63 to 72. So it's very important to point out that we, even with all the growth, I'm talking about the future, all the growth expected uh, to, to happen in Brazilian agriculture, the area of the country that will be used for agriculture is 10%. 10% of the country will be used for agriculture. So this is a very important number for us to keep when we listen to things that, oh, the bees are dying, you know, and uh, uh, it's a monoculture all over. It's 10% of the country being used for agriculture. 90% is not being used by uh, or, or, or for agriculture. So uh, then we, we have uh, also to call your attention that um, uh, it's the only business in Brazil that goes well. Uh, it's, it's tough to, to tell you that, but uh, look at our economy and in the green light you have the agribusiness trade balance and uh, the, the light green you have the other sectors of Brazil. So it's not going down uh, from 87 to 61 because this is only until September, okay? So it's still going up. Uh, and imagine removing agribusiness from our economy. What happens? What happens to exchange rates? What happens to inflation? What's ha what happens to job creation? And it's important for you to know that we are 210 million people with uh, income inequalities, uh, uh, having to, to put people to work, you know, to create opportunities. So agribusiness is what we have. So uh, it's very important to emphasize this. There's no other chance for Brazil to insert themselves in the world via agribusiness. There's no other possibility. So the fourth one, uh, it's uh, uh, also addressed here before. Uh, the next uh, 20 to 30 years will be very exciting to study the new generation of farmers and farming structures leading to land management concentration. I'm giving you now just one example here. You can find their information uh, on the website. It's in English. They're listed. 
And this is one of the examples of companies coming on in Brazil and concentrating production, uh, increasing yields, being able to adopt a lot of uh, in, uh, intelligence and, and data and all these kind of things and raising productivity up. So this is uh, important and don't for, I will address the social issues later on, but I want to tell you that uh, the way these guys are managing, the new generations coming in, they did agronomy, uh, they come with, uh, you know, their computer based and it's incredible to see how I can follow several farms in my region. When the sun comes back, it's a complete mindset of uh, how the farm was, was managed. Uh, the number five was the topic of our last panel and I have a lot of uh, expectations regarding to digital data, research and technology, saving resources and enabling competitive food for consumers. I do think that part of the efficiency gains that we will uh, uh, receive when we save machinery, when we have more results, will be again transferred to final consumers uh, of food. So here we have uh, 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 several pictures. Because of our time, I'm going to talk uh, about just one or two with you. But the one in the middle, it's already uh, happening in the Midwest of Brazil. It's a machine that has a light. The light sees uh, where the weed is, gives a signal to the machine, and then you put the chemical product just over the weed. So we changed the idea of gallons per acre to splits per plant. Splits per plant. So it's, uh, it's, it's efficiency. Uh, the other one in the right is, is developed by Bosch. They show this in AgriShow in Ribeirão Preto. So then you can have four types of weeds. They recognize it with a camera and they take four types of chemical products in the same application. So this uh, changes the concept. We're not managing by hectares anymore, we're managing by square meters. The technology is there in order for you to throw fertilizers just where they are needed, to put chemical products where they are needed and to save a lot. Save a lot in time, save a lot in costs, like the one you see up there, the black uh, phone. It's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's an app developed by a Brazilian that you just uh, uh, handle it and, and, you, and you move it towards the cattle, it gives you the weight, the exact weight of the animal. So you don't need to take the animal again to, uh, to measure the weight, it's over there in the field and it's, in, it's incredible what's going on. So I, I trust a lot in these efficiency gains benefiting uh, uh, final consumers. Uh, topic number six, and for this I have three slides because it's very important for Brazil. Uh, I think it's a, it's a green country in agriculture uh, and the most, uh, one of the most exciting topics in my opinion for the future is the payment for environmental services. I think agriculture all over the world has gains uh, to receive uh, when these things are more implemented and happening. So uh, here, uh, Brazil, why do I call Brazil a green country? Because when you look at the energy metrics of the countries in the world, Brazil has 45% of its energy coming from renewable sources. The average in the world is 17 and the average in the OECD countries is 10. So we are 45 of all the energy used in the country, renewable sources, when you go to the developed countries, this is only 10. Uh, it was spoken here about the forestry code. I recommend you guys in our dialogue to uh, study it. You can find it at the WWF uh, website in English. And it shows you what Brazil was able to uh, develop. And it's a very important uh, document that's being implemented for a sustainable development. And uh, no one received anything for that. Imagine that a uh, nice example, if you look there in Brazil, the 20% set aside area, 35% set aside and 80% set aside. So if you are a farmer and you bought your land in 1990, imagine that you bought this hotel here and then the mayor of Washington or, or the governor came and told you, okay, now you have to pick up 20% of your apartments and put salads in there. So you can't use them anymore commercially. So this is what happened with farmers. They had to set aside areas and, re, uh, and uh, put back again what they had there or to compensate. So it represented a cost increase. And I'm, uh, this is one of the topics also for us to discuss because the consumers will be pressuring uh, for the environmental code to be applied also in other countries. So this will represent a cost for agriculture and this is what I pointed out over there. Because as far as I know, in the, in the big countries, the toughest environmental code for producing uh, food and agriculture is in Brazil. 
So what happens if India, China, and other countries, even the European Union, have to apply a forestry code that limits the area and uh, has a lot of other obligations uh, for us? So uh, um, then we have a chart that shows you uh, where uh, the amount of land that's used, again, uh, for agriculture in Brazil, it's around uh, 10%. Then you have the pastures with 20%, then you have the cities, the lakes and everything, and then you have the area that's preserved. It's 66% of the area of Brazil is untouched in several ways. There are indigenous areas, there are uh, governmental areas, parks, there are areas inside the farms. That's the 25.6 that you see in the upper side. So areas that are preserved inside the, the, the farms. And then you have a comparison with the other big uh, food producing countries in the world. So uh, it's, uh, it's uh, protected agriculture and it's an environmental agriculture in Brazil. And I think it's, a, it's an important dialogue here for us to bring you the numbers because what you saw uh, was wrong in, uh, in July and August. We've seen a fever all over the world that damaged a lot Brazilian image and people didn't come back to say, well, I'm sorry what I've done and this was not true. So we've seen a cover page of The Economist, that's not true, this did not happen. We've seen kangaroos burning in the Amazon, I, it doesn't make, I, I haven't seen, <laughs> never seen a kangaroo over there, giraffes and several other things. So the media and also, uh, uh, you know, the, the influencers, presidents of countries posting pictures of, uh, of uh, uh, a photographer that died 10 years ago. So I don't know how he received that picture spiritually or whatever happened. So it doesn't make sense. It was a huge attack and that's the most recent number that you have. It's on the right side. So the burnings in the Amazon are exactly at the average of the last 10 years and are below the average of the last 20 years is the line just upper the, the line that hits the bar. So um, now what happens with the damage that was done to the image of the country? Yeah? It was already done. How are, of course here we can revert it because you're seeing the data, but and the ones that receive the pictures from football players, from artists, how are we going to revert uh, the image that we were burning all the forests and destroying the country and it would become a cattle a pasture in, in, in two or three uh, years. So uh, uh, also wanna, uh, I'm finishing here in the environmental topic, I want to address to you the biofuels because I follow very closely Brazilian biofuel policies and we have uh, the light blue that you see in the chart on the right side is the flex fuel fleet in Brazil. And I'm very happy to see that biofuels are coming back in recommendations of United Nations. So this is also a huge opportunity for Brazil to work together with the U.S. because we have China starting maybe next year a blending of 10% of uh, ethanol in their gasoline. This will represent maybe 50, 60 million tons of corn, extra corn needed in the world uh, to produce. And uh, we have um, <clears throat> nice example, examples from the fleet and the consumption in Brazil. I also want to point out Renova Bio. That's a program that uh, went through Brazil in the last two years. It's being implemented now that will give more premiums for carbon uh, saving technologies and for efficiency. And today you have some of the numbers there. Uh, I'm not going to read all of them to you because you're tired, but 48% of the fuel used in Brazil for the car fleet is ethanol. So it's probably the highest in the world. And if you look at the city of Sao Paulo, the megalopolis in the world, probably is the one with the cleanest fuel metrics in the world. You never heard about this because we are very bad to communicate. Uh, we have to tell good things that are going on because then we can uh, bring you uh, together to see the, the reasons and the dialogue and the things that are uh, going over there. Also, biodiesel is increasing from 10 to 15 percent and this represents shifting money from the oil business to agriculture. Yeah, when you put 5% more, if you look at the supply chain, you're removing from the supply chain of oil to the supply chain of agriculture. So uh, a lot of positive news uh, in, this, uh, in this area of uh, ethanols and, and biofuels in Brazil, and also electricity now. It's becoming a fever in the farms in Brazil to put electric and solar panels together. And here you see a picture of uh, Copper Citrus, uh, with this panel, they save $1,200 per day in electricity, just having this panel 
uh, beside the cooperative, helping to supply electricity for them. Uh, the number seven is the creative and sharing economy for innovation, credit, insurance and services and I'm amazed with what's going on over here. Uh, we should study this much more because this is going to change the rules of the game. This is going to change from the big guys to the smaller guys. So uh, I've seen uh, Uber systems of tractors in agriculture, of harvesters, of services. So if you look today, um, I was, uh, when I was 16 years old, uh, in Brazil we take the driver's license with 18. I was counting the year, the month, the day, the minute to have my driver's license. Today, for my, the students that I teach, maybe 50% of them didn't even go uh, towards the driver's license. Because a car, I don't want a car anymore. I, I want a, the rights to use. So we're, we're moving from a society that was asset-driven to a light asset society. So this will bring a lot of changes uh, towards agriculture, in my opinion. And I'm following what's going to happen next year in Brazil with the uh, strong interest of Alibaba. So we should study the marketplaces coming in because they change the rules of the game. So I have two bags of coffee to sell. I just upload in the system. It's a huge social inclusion program because I upload it in the system and someone will buy. Remember the Chinese uh, app that uh, has a value of more than $7 billion because it links the supermarkets of a certain city with the fresh uh, producers, uh, horticultural producers of that city and a Uber takes the products. So we're going to see a lot of changes in agriculture in the last 10 years and I think this will be very creative because new people will come in and will threaten the big guys and the big business. So there are opportunities here uh, with the, the sharing economy and the creative uh, economy. Uh, there's also a new role for cooperatives and um, we had a chance to speak here and I'll give you just two examples here. Uh, the left side is uh, Cochupé. Cochupé is the largest coffee cooperative in the world. And you know how many owners they have? 13,500 owners. So yes, there's a chance to be big in agriculture of 2050. If I think big, I can be big. And that's one of the, the, the chances. The one on the right side is an uh, incredible uh, uh, change that's going on because now you know, I'm, I'm a small farmer. I don't want to buy a drone and then this drone will have idle capacity. I don't know how to drive the drone. I don't have the license, you know. I don't want to buy all these new tech that's coming. But the cooperative uh, perceive that they can supply the complete services for these farmers, uh, being small, medium or even large farmers, and in a more efficient way than you buying and keeping the assets. So Copper Citrus is a, is a cooperative close to my city that I follow a lot and I partner of them. It's the area that grows more in the cooperative. It's what they call the digital uh, field. So the cooperative is applying the technology. And look what they've done to the farm, uh, uh, to the coffee farmer when they systematized the, the area. And the farmer with the same area has now much more coffee plants just because of, he used the, the technology supplied by the cooperative. So I know it's, it's creating margins all over because you're reducing uh, waste, reducing food waste, reducing waste of uh, space, waste of fertilizers, waste of crop protection. So uh, you get uh, more uh, carbon uh, driven uh, efficiency. So I'm in love with what's going on with the cooperative system in Brazil because they uh, most of them woke up that they are the guys to take the square meter management, the digital whatever, to, to the farmers. And this will create a lot of social inclusion also and keep people uh, in business. Uh, another beautiful example that, in my opinion, uh, coming back here, I, I'm, list, uh, I'm listing 10 points uh, for you that I think will challenge us to study more in the next uh, years until 2050 is the circular chains and, uh, and investments creating sustainability, margins and value added. So here's one example. Let me tell you a short story and then we come to the last topic. Um, in a region we used to have uh, cattle, only cattle. That's an uh, example is the city of Kirinópolis in Goiás. Uh, only cattle, you know, uh, uh, the amount of jobs was uh, small. Then suddenly they received the sugarcane factory in 2005. 
I measure this for their sustainability report. Uh, before the sugarcane factory came, the city of Kirinopolis had 800 companies. After the sugarcane factory came, they had 3,500 companies in the city. Can you imagine this, just attracting one agro-industry? In case there were two uh, sugar mills. But then you come with the cane, you crush the cane, you have the sugar, you have the ethanol, and you have the bagasse. Remember that the bagasse is burned in boilers, goes to the network, so you sell electricity for that region, and you can also use the electricity for your mill, for your industrial operations. Now what's becoming a fever in Brazil is to put just beside the sugarcane facility and corn ethanol facility. Because then the sugarcane corn does not produce electricity, so you have to buy from the network or you have to buy wood and burn or whatever. So you, you transfer the electricity from the sugarcane mill to the corn uh, facility and then you enter with one ton of corn, you have uh, 400 liters of ethanol, you have 330 kilos of DDG and then you have other products. And the DDG, who wants the DDG, which is a high protein uh, content? The cattle. So then you put a feedlot just beside. And then the feedlot, you can see here in the picture, does a lot of manure. The manure is treated and goes back to the corn and the sugar cane as a fertilizer. So this is a very nice example of a circular economy capturing value in the region. Imagine before cattle, now we have integrated activities that are receiving less inputs from outside and, and, and sending more outputs, having a, a nice example of, of uh, value creation. And the last one, which amazes me in terms of creativity, is related to engagement, storytelling, and all the old marketing things that now are easier because, you know, everything is digital. So you can follow, you can see, you can look at a coffee in a shelf, and then you can see the a film of the, the, the movie of the farm, and you can be in touch with the farmer. So I, I had 10 or 15 examples here to tell you how these are creating chances in agriculture. So I have in my state an oil, uh, olive oil producer on the right side at the top and uh, they received a, a recognition here in the US because of the quality. They won a contest here. Uh, it's, a, it's produced in Sao Paulo. never heard that Sao Paulo was able to produce olive oil. Then you have uh, um, uh, Acai and uh, Apex was helping this company. Uh, we were in Anuga trade fair in Germany last month and they were selling directly to supermarkets in Portugal and Spain, produced by small farmers in the, in the north of Brazil, poor farmers being included because of the storytelling, because of the brands and, and the processing. And on the left side, it's incredible, uh, the Luckin Coffee, probably you, you heard about this, uh, China uh, is also liking to drink coffee and we're lucky about this. <laughs> They're opening, you know, uh, how long does it take for them to open one new uh, coffee shop in Luckin Coffee? Five hours. In each five hours, there's a new Luckin Coffee being opened in China, and in 18 hours, a new Starbucks being opened in China. So uh, I was there, and I felt like a dinosaur. You know why? Because there's no more uh, credit cards, no more cash in China. It's only phones. It's, it's, uh, it's the system, payment system that they developed that started with Alibaba and now it's, a, it's an independent company. And uh, it was funny because the lady there doesn't speak a word of English, I don't speak a word of Chinese, and you can imagine my transaction to get a cup of coffee. And to understand their business model, which is outstanding because you order the coffee while you're walking and then you go there with your phone, take a look at the picture just in the middle. And then they, they scan it and then you take your coffee. So it's incredible, no more cash. Uh, a lot of data being uh, available because they know you, they know uh, your consumption behavior. So imagine the amount of things that we can do with this in the next 10 years. And the last one <coughs> is to invite you to have a beer uh, this evening. So I'm telling you the, the beer story. I received a WhatsApp uh, from a friend that that company over there called Leuven, they were in a crowdfunding experience. So I could enter a website that I never heard about. I was ashamed of not, not hurting, uh, hearing about this website because I'm a business professor. So I enter in the website and I've seen several companies for crowdfunding. And what happened? It, they raised 5 million reais or 1.5 million dollars in three days. That was the money they wanted. And so they had to hand, send money back to people because a community was created, engaged community. So I invested, I sent to 20 friends. I told them, let's be partners of this initiative, 
they want to build new product lines, they want to build a restaurant and whatever. Uh, so this is my last comment to tell you that uh, this will change the way we do credit in the world. Because uh, in two or three years from now, uh, a soybean farmer in Brazil can go to these crowdfunding uh, 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 platforms and a, a retired fireman in Texas can put his money in, in the soybean crop directly without uh, the traditional ways that we are uh, thinking about. So, of course, someone will guarantee, someone will give an insurance, but the fireman in Texas that receives 0% of interest rates, he can receive a 3% uh, for a, from a soybean farmer in Brazil in four months, and that's half of the so what the soybean farmer is paying if he goes to the market to capture the money. So a, a huge amount of changes will happen in our agriculture, and I hope I can be here to study. And I may think that you would like one picture to take home of my speech, so I prepared it to you here. That's the 10 topics that I think uh, will be important for us to consider in the coming years. And Brazil has an important role, the U.S. has an important role. We sometimes compete, but I think uh, uh, it's like 80% of chances of cooperation and 20% chances of competing. Okay, we are competing in corn, but we can develop the international ethanol market and then we are joining efforts in corn. So that's the idea. Uh, be creative and I want again to thank you all for being here, uh, thanking Apex for, for the invitation and uh, we will be available uh, uh, to answer some questions if you have. And this is my Twitter of the lecture. It's very positive uh, what we have to do, uh, the things that we can work with and it's going to be totally different from the last 20 years because we're going to have much more newcomers, uh, people included in the system because of the new technologies going on. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Neves and Dr. Hurdle. We do have time for one or two questions if there are any, so I'd like to open to the floor. All right, well, with that, I wanted to... Oh, go ahead. There's a microphone. Uh, Bob Thompson, uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies here in Washington. A uh, question for both of you. Uh, we know that Embrapa's uh, research appropriations are declining. We know Tom showed the data that uh, U.S. appropriations for ag research are declining. But Tom, at the very end of your, uh, the first section of your talk, your, your uh, blue or uh, turquoise bars, uh, to me that implied the investment that was needed to generate the ne necessary increase in productivity by the middle of the century, if I understood your point correctly. But yet that seems inc inconsistent with what's actually happening with both the U.S. and Brazil cutting back on public support for ag research. Uh, what's your take, both of you, what's your take on uh, the adequacy of current investments and uh, what it's going to take to get the, uh, the sustainable outcome as opposed to the, uh, the bad news that at least one speaker suggested, Claudia suggested? Well, I'll, I'll take a crack at that for starters. Um, yeah, the, just to clarify, the figures were uh, that I was projecting about the future productivity growth were very much dependent on what is being spent now as well as recent trends. So that was baking that in, and so the output growth is slower than it had been uh, historically because of that. And the composition changes a lot. So you see, I mean, um, assuming all of this investment in China bears fruit, and um, I think there's some evidence that that's happening, um, China becomes much more of a powerhouse. I don't know whether you remember a few decades ago, we thought China was a huge export market <laughs> for all kinds of things. Well, now um, their productivity growth has allowed them to stay in the game in a lot of uh, agricultural products. Um, so. Um, I think we're seeing, we'll, we'll be seeing a shifting of where, who, who's really competitive in agriculture and um, if we continue on this trajectory we'll become less competitive. Obviously we have a lot um, of, of inertia and momentum and some great institutions that are able to convert uh, those dollars into productivity at a higher rate than many places in the world, but um, I think that it's inevitable that we'll lose our, our, continue to lose market share. 
Well, thank you, Bob, for, for the nice question. Just a quick compliment. I was in China for 15 days now in, in June, and I, it's a different speed. It's a different speed, and uh, it's incredible what they are creating, and when they create something, they will win. You know why? Because they, they control the demand. They start with uh, 500 million users. And uh, I've seen this with Uber, I've seen this with uh, Luckin Coffee, with WhatsApp and whatever they bring to market in a creative way, they control the demand. And uh, I was impressed with the university system there and the amount of money they're putting in research. So it's, uh, it's a lot of things are going to come from China. And going back to Brazil, it's a pity what happened to our country in the last uh, 20 years in terms of uh, the management of the budget of the country. So you follow that closely, the fiscal deficit that we have, it's terrible. And the government had to cut in several areas. So uh, as soon as responsibility comes back in terms of the management of the, the, the budget, I'm sure that the government will be able to put more money in what generates income uh, instead of putting in income distribution. Uh, one thing that I've spoke a lot in the last 20 years in Brazil, that there's no sustainable income distribution without income generation. And when you don't put money in research, and you don't put in enough money on education, you will deteriorate the capacity of the country to generate income. Income is generated by individuals and by business, not by government. And then you take the country to the situation it was taken. So it's going to take some time for us to revert this, but I think that's the right direction. Just about, ooh, I'm sorry, we're just about out of time. Um, clearly today we covered a host of topics. Um, it's evident that we're facing a reality today that was unexpected and that we wouldn't have predicted 20 years ago and I think that'll continue to be the case for the next 20 years. Um, today's conversation was just the beginning. Um, I think it, it's incumbent on all of us to address this issue through innovative, sustainable technologies and outcomes. And so I want to thank Apex Brazil for putting on today's conversation, as well as Purdue University and all of our partners. And stay tuned for more conversations like these that we hope to continue to innovate with. Thank you all so much. For our